All right. Hello, everyone. And uh, today we'll talk about the databases and how do we hack open source databases, pen testing MySQL and PostgreSQL. And uh, my name is Alexander Rubin. I am a principal database engineer at Amazon Web Services. Uh, my background is MySQL. I have been doing MySQL consulting for a long time. I uh, started at MySQL AB, the company behind MySQL. I uh, joined Amazon uh, RDS, Relational Database as Service, um, in uh, 2020. And uh, I joined as a database engineer working on MySQL, uh, but then I switched to doing security. And security was my uh, uh, personal hobby. It started playing capture the flag games and doing security research. So I'm currently leading uh, what we call the red team, RDS red team at Amazon Web Services. And uh, I also have my colleague Martin here. Um, and uh, Martin is a member of my team and he is working on database security for 17 years. Uh, he joined uh, in January uh, this year, and uh, he is doing uh, lots of penetration testing on various AWS services, uh, focusing primarily on uh, databases, but um, other services as well. So let's see what this talk is about. So January, when you think about how do you pen test a, a database, you may think, well, first, let's run Nmap and see if the port is open, right? And then we'll try to do a brute force of passwords, something like that, right? That's usually not the case. The more common scenario is we have an SQL injection. And we will start with this scenario where our initial entry point into a database is through the SQL injection. And this is a common SQL injection scenario, right? And this guy is me looking at this stuff here, right? Uh, so how come? It's, it's very simple. It's pretty bad. We have this customer input. We have this, uh, like, user input uh, in there. And it's pretty easy through this SQL injection to get into the database. Right? And then the next thing what uh, an attacker will do or a pen tester will do, right, is to try to get into more deeply into the database. And in case of MySQL, MySQL has this users table. And this user table stores the username and the hash of the password. So we'll try this. But that was too easy, right? So what if we don't have an access to mysql.user. What kind of scenario we are talking here? So let's look at, we, we look through the typical entry point as a SQL injection, but what really is there? And this is a sample architecture, totally fictional architecture here, right? But this is more common scenario where we have different applications in different databases. And we have, a, in this particular case, we have a, a what is called multi-tenant applications. So let's imagine that this is a healthcare records company that stores the health records uh, PII, PHI data into the health database. But they also have a WordPress website, which is just information about the company, right? And then we can totally imagine, I can totally imagine that um, an attacker will find an SQL injection in WordPress, which is notorious uh, to have SQL injections, and get into the WordPress. But there is nothing interesting in the WordPress. So our goal is to, as pen testers, is to try to access the health records database. And in a good multi-tenant databases, there is a isolation. And MySQL provides an isolation method where if you have a full access to the WordPress database, 
you will not be able to get into the health records tab. So what I'm going to do next is I will demonstrate how a specific attack called Confused Deputy may help us to switch and break this isolation between the databases inside the single database instance. So what is the Confused Deputy problem? So Confused Deputy, Deputy here is a computer program that was tricked by another program to do something. And usually, this another program doesn't have specific privileges. And this confused deputy program has enough privileges. So we confuse the deputy to do something that we don't have privileges to do. Let me give you an example. So let's say that we are on Linux. And we want to make sure that all files in the home directory is owned by that specific user, right? So we created this cron job to run on a every minute to do the chown command on the home directory, right? That's a good idea, right? So we need to make sure that all the files inside of the home directory are owned by that user. So what can go wrong? Actually, there are lots of things that can go wrong here. So I have recorded this video, uh, this screen share, to demonstrate this. So let's see. So how does it work normally, right? So I created as root, um, I have this cron job, right, first of all. Then I create a file as root in a home directory of EC2 user, which is unprivileged user. And then, because we have this current job, it will run, and it will fix this problem. It will show this file to be owned by EC2 user. So in a second, it will do that. Not yet. Not yet. And here we go. So now, what can happen is a bad user can actually create a symlink from that user inside the home directory to etc password. And what will happen is that our cron job will be our confused deputy. So our ec2 user user is trying to confuse our system to give it more privileges. So our cron job will, will run, and what it will do is it will follow the symlink. We can create a symlink to any other file on the system, right? So when it follows symlink, it will actually show on the etc password and change the user of etc password to ec2 user. So it, in a second, it will happen. It just happened. And now, this ec2 user can edit the etc password and get obtain any privilege they want. Right, we can create another root user, we can change the ec2 user ID, we can do anything. So basically, we have successfully executed, by creating a symlink, we have successfully executed a confused deputy. We confused our current job into doing something malicious. Now that we know how it works on Linux, let's see how this applies to the databases. So again, we have this architecture, just to remind. Our goal is to get into health records database, and the MySQL database is sort of protected. So let's dive deeper into this architecture and see what do we have on the MySQL part. So we have uh, a number of databases. We have a Corp WordPress, well, it's actually users. We have a number of users here, right? We have Corp WordPress user uh, that have all and every access to the WordPress database 
which have absolutely nothing interesting in it. And we have health data service user, which have uh, all access to the health records. But in addition to that, we have this monitor user. So what is this? Let's take a look at a list of the privileges. So again, we have Corp WordPress user, which have all and every privilege on the uh, WordPress database. We have health data service user, has all the privileges on health data service, which is what we are attacking here. And we have the monitor user, which have uh, select and execute. So it actually has a select on star dot star. That means that it can select from all and every database. But it also have just select. It doesn't have uh, an ability to write to the system. So this user is used for, usually is used for performance monitoring system or can also be used for as a database administrator. So the question is, can we confuse this monitoring system into giving us an access to either MySQL database or healthcare system? If we will try to use this, our current user, which is WordPress user, and we'll try to select from the MySQL user, there will be no access, right? Because it's not allowed to read this user and passwords. But if we will do that from the monitoring user, because it has a global select, it can actually give us the passwords. So let me get a little bit deeper into what the database performance monitoring do. So it's usually it's a system that helps database administrators and it collects the database metrics, it collects slow queries, and it also, what it also does, it generates explain plan. An explain plan will help database administrator to understand why the query is slow and uh, how it goes. So what database administrator do? Review database metrics, collect slow queries, and actually use explain plans to optimize the queries. Right? So now when we know what the database operations are, we can see deeper. So let's take an uh, example of this explain plan. When we run the explain, we rerun the SQL statement with the explain prepended to it. And it will take this in a, a typical scenario, a database administrator, a database engineer, will take the slow query and uh, run explain plan. So what does explain plan do? It doesn't re-execute the query, right? So if we run this, it will never execute select query again, correct? Actually, in some cases, it will. And let's take a look at what cases and how it will work. So that was actually a known thing for a long time. Well, relatively long time. Uh, in 2020, uh, Percona, a database consulting company, has um, published this blog post about a case where an explain plan can actually re-execute the select query once again. And this is really bad for various reasons not only for security. If someone was doing something and you re-executed this query again, then you make the database inconsistent. So in this example, we create a subquery. And the reason why it actually re-executed this query is because it needs to calculate, it needs to collect the statistics and metrics. So to actually create the adequate metrics, it will need to materialize this subquery. So it will execute this query, and this query will run for a long, long time. Now, how do, can we use that? And how can we escalate the privileges? So what we will do is we will, um, first of all, uh, in the WordPress database, an attacker can create any objects. It can create 
tables, functions, etc. So let's create a proof of concept where we will intentionally generate a slow query with a subquery in it, and we will try to grab the username and password from the MySQL system database. So what we'll do first is we will create this proof of concept. We'll create an exploit function. And this exploit function, inside of that function, we will select the password, which is called authentication string in uh, MySQL. And we will also make this query slow. So what we will do is, inside of this function, we will check if the user is monitor or not. If it's not monitor, then we will just simply make this query slow, so it will, pick, it will be picked up by the monitoring system. And then if the, if the query is executed by the monitoring user, we will just simply select. But the question is, how do we obtain this information? How do we send it back to our WordPress user? Um, give me a second. For some reason, my Mac is not charging. Can I get a working um, uh, uh, power? All right, uh, so um, where we are. Uh, so the question is, how do we send this back to our WordPress user? Right, and um, the answer is that uh, there are another function that we can use, and we can use a definer. So the definer in uh, MySQL database works as a suite bit. Whenever you execute a function which have a definer in it, this function will be executed in a context of um, uh, in the context of that user. So we have created this uh, um, function with a definer of the our unprivileged user. Yeah, I'll, let me switch that. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so we will create this function with um, a definer of our unprivileged user, and remember that we have the ability to insert. So what we'll do is we will create a, another function, we'll create a save function, which will allow us to actually save the password into a table that we fully own and control. So let's uh, take a look at the, the final um, uh, proof of concept. So we create this function called exploit. Inside of that function, we retrieve the password, we put it in a variable, and then we run another function which specifies the definer. So that will allow us to save the password into our table. And then we'll make it slow. So now we can save this uh, admin password, and we can just simply execute the select query. So I have recorded this uh, demo, and let's see how it works. So I have all these uh, functions prepared here. And uh, I now, uh, let's make sure that we have a correct user, current user. Our current user is Corp WordPress user. Uh, and now I have prepared my uh, uh, table P, which will have the password saved into it. And now I generate the slow query. So I will have a select start from, and then I have a subquery here, which will just select from the, just use the exploit function, right? So this is a slow query. I make it three seconds. So now this query will be picked up by the monitoring system or even by the database administrator. 
And this database administrator will go here on the other side of the screen and run the explain. And then the database administrator will be confused. Why this is not slow anymore? What happened? But now our user actually can select and see this is a password. So we successfully retrieved the admin password, and we could have just selected anything from the, uh, from, uh, the healthcare database. So now, in this particular example, we obtained the, our uh, monitoring password, right? So now we can reconnect using a monitor user and this password. But the problem is this is not the actual password. This is a hash of the password. So next thing what I will do is I will start up my GPU EC2 instance, eight GPU cores, and run the hash cat. And um, I will use the... Oh, uh, I will use the um, RockU uh, file to basically try to get the password out of that. And let's see how quickly it will work. So I, I created this, I removed the star from the beginning of the password so that it will work with a hash cat. A star is just a MySQL specific. And let's see. So it, it just less than, a, less than a second, right? And the reason why, the password is pass. And do you have any idea why the monitoring user has this super simple password? Because nobody thought that this user is important. A some database administrator set it up quickly to be able to get the metrics on the database. And set up this highly unprivileged user and set up a simple password. So to recap, what we did so far is we confused our monitoring system or we confused an actual person, DBA, into running explain on statement. We have created on purpose this malicious SQL statement that retrieved the data that we normally will not be able to retrieve. All right, and uh, that worked actually because monitoring user had global select and execute privileges. So we got a monitoring user password hash. It was a simple password, very easy to crack. And as a result, an attacker can connect as monitoring user and get the healthcare data. So this part is done. In our particular scenario, what we did is we went from the SQL injection, get some random WordPress database. With this multi-tenant architecture, we're able to utilize the monitoring system to get into the health records database. All right, this is a totally fictional scenario. And uh, first of all, what about PostgreSQL? It is much more complicated, but still possible. I don't have a proof of concept yet. If I will have a proof of concept, then I will present about that uh, at some conference as well. All right, so we, where we are. So at this point, we used an SQL injection, attack the relational database, and get a full access to the relational database. Can we go further? So what will be our next step? Our next step will be what is called database escape. And uh, Martin will be talking now about the methods and how you get the escape from the database. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So uh, in this uh, part, I will talk about uh, getting from a database to operating system establishing a footprint on uh, OS from database. 
So what do we have? Uh, we have uh, access to a database with the highest privileges. We are an admin on a database. And what we need to do, we need some sort of common execution, operating system uh, common execution. I ideally, it should be privileged, but unprivileged will work for us as well, because we can later use some sort of LPE to get uh, more privileged access. So let's do the first part. Um, we will work on uh, MySQL first. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll work on Postgres first, then MySQL. In uh, Postgres, it's uh, relatively easy uh, as long as you get a database administrator access. On MySQL, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's still doable. So uh, for Postgres, we can do two things. We can uh, use a statement called copy table from program on Postgres as long as we are admin on a Postgres database. Or we can use an archive comment as well. So how does this work? I did a small uh, demo here. Hopefully it's readable. Uh, this is a connection to a Postgres machine. First of all, let's examine if there is a file on disk. Under TMP, I'm looking for Saint Con text file. It's not there. Now let's connect as a Postgres, which is an admin, to our database and do uh, a create table. Uh, we need this uh, table uh, as a prerequisite for the copy statement to work. This is a dummy table. Uh, its format is not important. OK, we have a table. And now we run this copy uh, table name from program statement, which is allowed because we are admins on a Postgres. And as a comment, I will supply a simple touch TMP saying con. Good, let's check. The file is there. It's easy, right? Okay, moving on. Let's uh, try to do the same with the archive comment. This is another option in Postgres. Again, uh, let's double check that there is no file yet on the TMP. Nothing yet. Connect as a Postgres, which is an admin. And uh, I do alter system set archive comment to my comment, which again is touch TMP Saint Con. You can do that, alter system, because you're an admin within Postgres. And another comment, uh, I enable uh, archive mode. It should be on or always for this to work. Uh, the only uh, problem here is that uh, the server needs to be restarted or recycled after the uh, older um, st system set archive mode is changed. So here for simulation, I just restart the service, but in real world, uh, the bad actor can just wait for the server to reboot after, let's say, operating system update or something like that. Okay, we restarted and the file is there. Pretty easy. Now let's uh, look at the reverse shell example. Again, Postgres. Uh, I have my uh, windows split into two parts. In one, I will run a netcat. And another one, I will do the PSQL. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, uh, we are connecting as an admin to Postgres. Uh, again, we do create table, our dummy table. And then we start a net, netcat listener on the same machine just uh, to make it easy. And now I use a uh, payload which will connect to, to my netcat listener. And as you can see, I can run comments. In the real world, because uh, attacker will use a remote address, a uh, remote IP. So that's a remote shell for Postgres. Now, uh, a MySQL part. In MySQL, uh, it's a little bit more tricky, but still doable. So what we do, we create a table first. Uh, we upload our binary uh, payload to this table. 
and we export data from this table to disk. And when we use exported file as a source of user-defined function, uh, which will allow us to run comments on, uh, on the machine. All right, here's how we create a file. Uh, we connect as an admin root in case of MySQL. Uh, switch to MySQL database, uh, create a table, and just insert some, uh, some value into this table, and later we'll export that. So here I just uh, pick a simple, simple uh, four byte value. for this demo, but in reality it could be any, any binary. Okay, this is an insert, and uh, now I do the export to a local, to a local uh, disk of a server. Before that, I will examine the plugin uh, directory location on this machine to be able to write directly to this uh, plugin uh, location, which will help us later on. So I do show variable and just uh, repeat with select into out file. There is one a prerequisite for this to work, the secure, uh, secure file prev, file prev uh, mm -hmm. setting should be set to an empty value. All right, as you can see, uh, we, we have been able to write to a disk with uh, four bytes. But like I said, it could be a, uh, any binary. Next part, uh, let's uh, create a function which will help us to run operating system commands. This is a source code. Uh, you can easily find it on a, on a GitHub, I think. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, Russian definition. Mm -hmm. Yep, so here you can see it's very simple uh, wrapper around the system, uh, system uh, C runtime uh, function. And uh, what we do here, we just uh, compile this into a shared object on Linux. And using technique from previous slide, we can upload it to, to a file system of a MySQL machine. It's just a ELF file. You can create a program to upload it through insert to a table and then export it. And the final step, common execution. Here we again uh, test for file existence before we do anything. File is not there. We connect uh, as root to uh, MySQL. When we create the function here, uh, referencing our uploaded uh, UDF shared object, and just do select uh, using this do system uh, function name to create a file. Let's check, the file is there. So that's a MySQL demo for common execution. And like I said, uh, after we got uh, basic common execution, we can do, uh, Another step, try to escalate to root, for example, on the box. That's All right, part. thank you, Martin, for the demo. And uh, the final step here is how do we move laterally? So at this point, again, 
uh, we had uh, been able to start with the SQL injection, escalate the privilege inside the database, uh, get into the database server itself using unprivileged shell, and uh, possibly even escalate to root. We haven't looked into how to escalate to root, but. So the next thing, we will try to actually move laterally. And usually, how does it work is if we want to move laterally, right? We want to switch to move to the application server. So application server connects to MySQL to do something, right? In this particular scenario, we use SQL injection. We hit the application server. But with the SQL injection, we don't e we don't actually have an access to the application server. We connect to the database. So how do we try to get into the MySQL client? So what we will do is we will use this rogue server technique and we'll try to read any file, arbitrary file, from the client. So here what we'll do is, again, if you are on the database server, you are running as a user that runs this database server. It's usually not root. It's usually something like Postgres or MySQL user. But you have the ability to shut down that server and start something, start something to replace that. And this user will be able to, to bind on the same port. So what we will do here is we will replace our normal MySQL server with a rogue server. And when we replace that with a rogue server, we will trick MySQL client to read any file from the client host. This vulnerability has been known for, for years. And the good news is that in the recent MySQL versions, this is not possible. Again, I also want to say that MySQL has much more secure defaults now. Like what Martin has demonstrated will not be possible with the default configuration. But with this rogue server, we can at least try to trick, again, our client that connects to MySQL to obtain a file. So how does it work? MySQL has this load data local in file command. And what this load data local in file command does, it actually tells the client to read the file and send it to the server. That was a common way to import the files into, um, uh, into the MySQL table. But what is also interesting about this is the server can tell the client, give me a file, and I will put it in a table. But with a rogue server, we can actually reply with this packet, load data in file packet, to any connect. So this is basically the work that has been done by uh, in 2018 to trace the MySQL protocol, uh, do the Varshark TCP dump on the MySQL connection. And uh, those guys realized that there is a capabilities flag. And when you say this capability flag, it actually can trick the client to send the server arbitrary file. So with this, we can actually move, try to move laterally. We can try to read ETC passwords. We can try to read uh, whatever else. We can even try to read ETC shadow if the client is running from root, which is unlikely, but let's see. So, a quick recap. We went from SQL injection to escalating privileges, downloading the healthcare data in our fictional example, to 
run any commands, a shell commands on uh, MySQL server on Linux to moving laterally, moving to the client. So how do we fix that? So first of all, obvious, protect application from MSQL in injection. Um, use prepared statements, sanitize the input, and also grant only what is needed. You don't want to grant select star on star to some monitoring user that you not even know about. And always use the latest versions. Uh, MySQL, PostgreSQL. Uh, MySQL specifically has now much more secure defaults, and none of those privilege escalation that we demonstrated, starting with the Martin's demo and my lateral movement, will not work. So that's all that I wanted to talk about. Um, again, my name is uh, Alex, and I'm also building this uh, team. Uh, which is a new team, not so new anymore, but I'm building the red team at Amazon Web Services. If you are interested in uh, joining my team, uh, doing some uh, penetration test on our services, please come to see me. All right, and uh, I have uh, some time for the questions, if uh, anyone have. Yes. Correct. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. That's a good call out. The copy command uh, is not necessarily fixed. So the um, PostgreSQL and MySQL has a, a different, um, what I would call, privilege model, right? And the Postgres community always said that um, the super user, the root user on Postgres have the ability to execute the commands. And uh, there are tons of ways how we can execute the commands as long as we have the root user. Um, and so, but the prerequisite of that is to, uh, to be able to obtain that root user, the super user, right? So, and the normal user that uh, is connecting to the to the database doesn't have that um, capabilities. In MySQL, it's a, it's a different privilege model. It's different user uh, auth model, where it's much simpler. Uh, it uh, basically have uh, uh, the, the database level privileges and table level privileges and uh, other stuff. But in MySQL, even if you have a super user, on the database, you're not supposed to have anything to be able to execute the commands, unless you make this insecure default or insecure configuration. Yes? That's, that has been discussed with the Postgres community. Uh, the one of the things is that Postgres allow this archive command that basically implements the, I think it's redo log, right? It's a redo log archiving uh, through the shell command from the, from the file level. And uh, that's why it have this capability to execute the shell commands. And this is what we have abused. I would uh, totally love to have a, a, a different model in Postgres where we can configure it and say, absolutely no shell commands execution equals true. But it doesn't exist right now, as far as I, as far as I know. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.